Hi, I'm Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. My guest today is Patrick Donnelly. He's Nevada State Director at the Center for Biological Diversity and lives in the Mojave Desert on the edge of Death Valley. He's been involved in desert conservation for 17 years, including leading desert tortoise habitat and wetlands restoration projects, engaging local communities to achieve permanent protections for over 2 million acres of public lands in the California desert, and now advocating for Nevada's biodiversity and climate statewide. His work takes him from Las Vegas to Reno to Elko to all points in between, whether lobbying in a suit or tromping through a desert marsh in muck boots. So first off, thank you for your work in the world, and second, thank you for being on the program again. Yeah, thank you for having me. Always good to talk to you. Oh, thank you. You too. So today, um, let's talk about the desert tortoise. Um, who are they and and what is happening to them? Yeah, well, the desert tortoise is a uh, remarkable reptile that lives uh, across the desert southwest. Um, so they're in the Sonoran and Mojave deserts and uh, are really a relic uh, from a wetter time when these deserts were, uh, uh, you know, 10,000 years ago in the last ice age, these deserts weren't deserts. Uh, they were they were semi-arid and uh, wetter locales and uh, tortoises, uh, an abundance of, of tortoises and turtles thrived here. And uh, as the climate dried out, um, these these relics from the past uh, adapted to that drier climate and became desert creatures and uh, continue to persist in the Mojave and, and Sonoran deserts. Now, despite the fact that they're in both deserts, I think the kind of popular conception of the desert tortoise and certainly the, the conservation locus has been around the Mojave population of the desert tortoise. Um, and uh, uh, which which also includes the Colorado desert in California. So it's basically the California, Nevada, and Utah populations that have become sort of the conservation icon um, uh, of the Endangered Species Act and, and uh, uh, it's in the Mojave Desert. And so I see that there are several um, – that there are two species of it, and are they both in trouble? Or then what I what I see here is I don't know how to pronounce it Agassiz and Marafkas, and are they are they both endangered or is only one endangered? Yeah, it's the Agassiz desert tortoise, uh, Gopharis agassiz, um, which is the uh, the threatened species, um, and that is the Mojave uh, population. Um, so uh, that is the one that is of focal conservation concern. So and before, go ahead, please. Well, so these are these are uh, uh, medium-sized uh, tortoises. Um, uh, you know, a large tortoise can be, uh, boy, as much as two inch, two feet long uh, for a very large one. Although more typically, you're going to find tortoises in the eight to sixteen inch range, perhaps. Um, uh, they they live in burrows, uh, typically along desert washes, but also in rock formations. Um, they uh, don't really drink water for the most part. They uh, get most of their water from the vegetation they eat, so they're herbivorous, and they eat forbs, the wildflowers, uh, the grasses, and um, that is where they get much of their water, which they store in their bodies. And they're they're truly remarkable survivors uh, of the deer. And um, you know, historically, uh, when they were abundant before uh, the, the current problems they face. Um, they were really a, a building block, uh, a keystone species, if you will, of the Mojave Desert ecosystem. Uh, so those burrows, after a tortoise uses those burrows, they'll be used by any number of other animals. Um, they spread seeds, they disperse seeds, uh, they provide important nutrient cycling. And at, at a time in the past, they were extremely abundant. Uh, the, the old timers say the desert was crawling with tortoises. Um, and, and so... Historically, these were a really integral part of our desert ecosystem. So before we before we go on, can you talk a little bit more about um, their their behavior or not behavior, but their role as a as a keystone species? And I'm thinking about um, gopher tortoises in the southeast. There's like I don't know 200 species who depend on their burrows. Um, and so, can you talk a little bit about a little bit more about that, and also talk about, um, I mean, they're, they're slow and tiny. How do they dig a burrow, and how big are these burrows? Yeah, so the desert tortoise's burrow is going to be used by any number of creatures, from a, a kit fox or a badger uh, 
um, to uh, uh, potentially smaller creatures like ground squirrels or um, or pocket gophers. Um, uh, they're they're uh, they and also abandoned burrows have this interesting feature where they can provide shade and windbreak to help promote germination of seeds. Uh, so you can actually see a proliferation of uh, plants in an abandoned burrow. So these burrows perform a pretty important function in, in maintaining the desert ecosystem, and I think that's a, a an important piece of the tortoise's role. I think also nutrient cycling is very important. Um, you know, in terms of their uh, 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 eating the, the plant life and digesting that and uh, fertilizing the soil with the uh, excrement, but also um, the tortoise's bodies themselves as they uh, accumulate calcium uh, in their shells. And then when they when they die, that would be a source of calcium for creatures and for the soils. And so, uh, you know, when at a time when these creatures were abundant, they really played an important role in this ecosystem. So who eats them? Well, uh, historically, it could have been a variety of creatures. I think you're mostly going to find predation of uh, uh, smaller tortoises. I think most creatures would have a pretty hard time eating a, a, a you know foot and a half long tortoise ensconced in a very tough shell. Um, but certainly, there is predation of small tortoises by uh, well, uh, currently the biggest thing is ravens. Uh, ravens have proliferated in the desert uh, with with humans in more recent times, and so raven predation of ju- juvenile tortoises is a major issue. Um, but also other birds of prey might uh, might eat juvenile tortoises, um, and then uh, you know the, there could there could be other predators, uh, potentially foxes or others, who might uh, try to get at a desert a juvenile tortoise before it you know toughens up as it gets bigger. So how long does it take for it to go? For it to get to be fairly, um, I know this is too strong a word, but fairly invulnerable. How long is the danger period for a young tortoise? I don't know the answer to that uh, specifically. Um, certainly within the first 10 years is a very vulnerable time, but I can't say when the sort of cutoff point is. These are very long-lived creatures um, uh, who take a very long time to reach reproductive maturity and um, uh, in general have a lengthy juvenile period of development. So I I have another strange question, after which we'll get to some perhaps easier ones. Um, And the the strange question is I've I've noticed that if I throw fairly large bones into the forest here, Pacific Northwest, um, they can take a long time to break down. So I've started asking all sorts of people, like what happens to huge buffalo bones, bones that might be too big even for grizzly bears to to chew on? Who who takes them down? Because I'm tremendously fascinated by decay. So what happens? So you have a tortoise lives to be 80 years old, however old, and then dies of old age. And then I'm not worried about the flesh because insects or whomever will eat that. But in the desert, how does the shell break down? Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the shells take a very long time to break down. And so, you know, in, in my time in the desert, I've seen, you know, I don't know, maybe 100 desert tortoises over the 17 years I've been out here. But I've seen hundreds of shells. They, 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 they persist for a very long time. Um, but, uh, you know, I actually don't know the exact mechanisms for breakdown. Certainly weathering is a piece of it. I think a lot of that... Uh, calcium is going into the soil rather than um, getting eaten by creatures. Um, but, uh, you know, certainly there must be some degree of creatures uh, exploiting that mineral source. So they used to be, you know, used to be so many that, that probably from the sound of it, one could see a 100 in several days or perhaps more often. And now you work on this issue and you've only seen a 100 of them. So talk about the decline. The desert tortoise has experienced an absolutely catastrophic decline, and if trends do not change dramatically soon, uh, we will see its extinction possibly within our lifetimes. Um, uh, historically, they were extremely abundant um, in certain places in the desert in the best quality habitat, and you know, I mean the. That abundance, and they were a central piece of, for instance, the Lifeways 
of the indigenous people who call the Mojave Desert home, who use them for food, who use their body parts for tools. And, you know, this was a piece of their culture. Um, but they were so abundant that, you know, when European descended people got out to the Mojave Desert, um, they uh, used their dominant ethos of how they interact with wildlife to uh, uh, destroy these species. So, for instance, the story goes people used to line them up on a piece of wood and shoot them for target practice. There were so many you could just go out in the desert and grab them, line them up on a plank and, you know, use them for target practice. Uh, another uh, anecdote is that the dirt bikers, when the dirt bikes started becoming popular, would go out, round up some tortoises, put them in a little vertical uh, uh, lengthwise pen, you know, and, and ride right over them, over the top of them. Um, uh, so they were abundant enough that they were readily abused by people who would do such horrible things. And, you know, that's really the story of the past hundred years of the desert tortoise's existence is this increasing uh, abuse by uh, by humans in the desert southwest, both direct mortality, like the kind of horror show I'm describing, or, you know, more often indirect mortality through the destruction of habitat. And, um, you know, as a result, tortoises now occupy just a fraction of their former habitat. Um, they've experienced as much as a 90 percent decline in abundance over that period. And in many parts of their range, they are currently functionally extinct. So they no longer fulfill the ecosystem functions that they at one time did fill and uh, could be considered functionally extinct. So I'm, I'm looking at, um, I'm looking at an article about desert tortoises. It says that, uh, estimates of densities, uh, prior to their collapse, uh, varied from eight individuals per square kilometer to over 500 individuals with the most estimates running, uh, somewhere in the range of 150 or slightly less individuals per square kilometer, which is, which is, I'm just emphasizing how incredibly, um, dense that is. Yeah. There were a lot of tortoises out there back in the day. And, you know, when you consider the densities we see today, it's it's just illustrative of what a catastrophic decline it's been for this species. Because today, um, you know, it's far below that. The density is actually the, the key metric we look at when we're considering the uh, the tortoise's fate. Um, there is a supposed minimum density threshold for viability, which is four tortoises per square kilometer. And so the best available science says that when uh, there are fewer than four tortoises per square kilometer, essentially the male tortoises spend their entire lives wandering around looking for females and they'll never find one. So you need more than four tortoises per square kilometer to maintain reproductive viability for a population. Well, the, the, the catastrophe, the catastrophic and utterly tragic situation we're in right now is that most tortoise populations are below four tortoises per square kilometer. And that is utterly horrifying because it implies that the tortoises alive now in those parts of the tortoises range are the last tortoises and they're not going to find a reproductive mate. And when they die, the, the tortoise is extirpated from those regions. And so that, uh, that horrifying number is true across most of the tortoises range. So all of California, the California desert is below four tortoises per square kilometer, except the high country in Joshua Tree National Park, which is still doing fairly well. In Nevada, much of Nevada is below four tortoises per square kilometer, except on the northeast side, up in Coyote Springs Valley and Mormon Mesa, Gold Butte. Um, and then up in St. George in Utah, there's actually very high densities, 15 or 20 tortoises per square kilometer. So much, much better shape up on the north side of the range. But, but what this implies is that, for instance, in California, it's entirely likely that within our lifetimes, a desert tortoise will be extirpated from the state of California. That is like not an outrageous statement to make. It could plausibly happen. And those, those low densities are that's what gives you nightmares. That's what keeps you up at night because you have this horrifying vision that those tortoises out there are the last ones. So why why have the densities gone down? Is that because the habitat is degraded, or is that through direct uh, direct 
predation either by humans or ravens or whomever. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the causes of tortoise decline are so numerous. Um, I would say the type of <laughs> sort of flagrant, disgusting mortality of tortoises from humans recreating has, uh, you know, in that in the way I described earlier, has not occurred anymore because it's so hard to find a tortoise. Um, but but the causes, you know, are degradation of habitat, number one. And so off-highway vehicles is a major driver of this, um, uh, particularly in the California desert. Off-highway vehicle recreation is the dominant use of public lands. And um, uh, there is extensive research out there documenting how uh, a proliferation of roads, of road networks, uh, fragments tortoise habitat, fragments reproductive connectivity, and ultimately decreases tortoise numbers. Um, which which in turn decreases density. So that's a huge driver. Uh, raven predation. The effects of raven predation on juvenile tortoises cannot be overstated. Uh, ravens historically were relatively rare in the desert, um, especially in the open creosote flat bajadas where the tortoises live. Um, ravens would have been more concentrated around water sources historically. But human disturbance and human encroachment into the desert, particularly with our trash, uh, dumps, you know, subsidies, uh, food subsidies to ravens, um, uh, roadkill. All of these have allowed ravens to proliferate across the desert landscape. Uh, also, power lines and other structures that they can perch on so they can see the juvenile tortoises. It's a recipe for disaster. And so raven mortality is just enormous uh, uh, with juvenile tortoises. And it, it's, it's really a, a frightening driver. And, and then finally, um, climate change plays a huge role as well. Uh, we are seeing much hotter temperatures in the summer. We're seeing much less precipitation and much more erratically timed precipitation. You know, the tortoise's life cycle really revolved around eating a ton of material during the spring when the desert is abundant with vegetation, with annual vegetation. And that's a huge part of the tortoise's diet. When changes in temperature and precipitation cause changes in annual vegetation, you know, that has potentially significantly thrown the tortoise's life cycle out of whack and most likely affected reproductive rates. So you mentioned earlier the, the off-highway vehicles and the fragmentation of habitat. Is the problem the actual noise or do they, are they one of those creatures who won't cross a, who won't cross a, a, a road or a dirt track? Yeah, there, there's noise, there's direct mortality, uh, um, and there is, right, the, the natural uh, aversion to open spaces that many creatures in the middle part of the food chain have. Um, uh, so all of those combine to uh, uh, have a negative effect, have those road networks have a negative effect. Um, you know, in some places in the desert, you're talking about very intensive use by off-highway vehicles. We're not talking about, you know, a Jeep driving through once an hour. Um, you know, you're talking about thousands upon thousands of dirt bikes and ATVs buzzing around the desert, um, really impacting all the wildlife, not just desert tortoises. Oh, when you, I, I was very surprised by what you said when you just said it's not light use like one Jeep every hour. I thought light use was going to be one Jeep every two months. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in places I like to hang out, out in the middle of Nevada, that is true. In the California desert, it's not. The California desert is a heavily, heavily recreated place. And there are some places where you can get away from it all, but um, the type of place where one person comes by every two months, I think you'd be hard-pressed to find that anywhere in the California desert anymore. So I mean, you're talking about the second largest city in America within an hour of Joshua Tree. Um, so... So you're you're talking about pretty much a constant speedway. You're not. This, I mean, this is like a a dirt highway in terms of traffic. I think that's true across a lot of the desert. There's very significant levels of OHV use, and it affects all wildlife. Certainly, I mean, they are not adapted to having large whizzing vehicles going by through the middle of undisturbed habitat. So we should do this off. Off tape, but I'm going to ask you anyway. Can we do an interview on OHVs in the desert? Sure, sure. I can give you my perspective. I think there's people who make that a focal point of their work, which I I do not. Um, right. But I can certainly 
I always get my perspective on things. Because honestly, the I I I I hate ORVs and I I know they're bad, but I had no idea. I mean, I I know I keep saying this, but for one Jeep every hour to be light use is horrifying to me off a road. Yeah, well, that's that's really how places in the California desert are. Okay, um, so let's go back to the to the to the desert tortoises themselves. And I was reading that they spend almost all their time in burrows. And are there? I'm guessing that construction also. Well, I want to ask a couple of questions. One is I'm guessing that construction will off, often crush burrows. I mean, is there is that a major source of mortality too, or is that a smaller source? Construction of of what? Of anything. Um, well, okay, so then, I mean, then we get to the last driver of the tortoise's <clears throat> extinction, which is direct habitat loss. And so the, the Mojave Desert has had significant encroachment from residential sprawl, industrial sprawl, and now energy sprawl. And so you're, you've seen huge amounts of habitat loss, especially in the West Mojave Desert in the Palmdale, Lancaster area and out toward Tejon Ranch. Uh, massive, you know, there's, there's a quarter million or more people living out in that valley, uh, all of them on, you know, five acre plots or whatever. Uh, that's an exaggeration, but you know, there, there's a lot of residential development and then, uh, proliferation of utility scale solar development as well. So large solar farms that bulldozed Joshua Tree woodlands and desert tortoise habitat, um, uh, there in the West Mojave. You've seen the same thing around Victorville, that part of the Mojave Desert, significant residential sprawl. Um, and then you got to look to the North Mojave and uh, Las Vegas. Um, Las Vegas has eaten up hundreds of thousands of acres of high quality desert tortoise habitat and utility scale solar development along the Highway 15 corridor has eaten up many, many thousands of acres more uh, habitat. And so, you know, ravens are a problem. Climate change is a problem. OHVs are a problem. But if we bulldoze their habitat, pave it over or put mirrors on it, you know, that is the ultimate destruction of the species so if are our desert tortoises themselves pretty shy or if if their habitat isn't being overtly destroyed can they can they survive human interactions like raccoons do fine around humans ravens do fine around humans bears do fine around humans um um spotted owls are more shy you know various creatures are more shy are these are these, uh, if there wasn't massive destruction, would they be able to get along? Like, if somebody had one house out in the desert, uh, would the would the would the desert tortoises avoid that as well? I mean, most of the people I know who have a house out in the middle of the desert have very little wildlife that avoid their place. You know, they see wildlife all the time. I think tortoises are resilient enough that they can survive a variety of conditions, but it's also very conclusively demonstrated that the less impact an area has, the higher the population of tortoises. So they thrive in places that are undisturbed by humans. That's where they do their best. And, you know, you, you it would be rare if you lived in the middle of nowhere to see a tortoise come up on your porch, you know, and sit under your easy chair to get some shade. I mean, <laughs> they're not you know, drawn to humans or disturbance in any way. So, so as opposed oh, to a rac- oh. as opposed to a raccoon, which you would yeah, see on your nothing porch. Like, nothing like a raccoon, that's for sure. So can you talk about the efforts for Center Center for Biological Diversity and other organizations to protect the the tortoises? And don't yet talk about any possibilities for captive breeding programs. I want to ask you about whether that's in existence later. But talk about efforts to protect by your organization and others. Yeah, uh, the, the desert tortoise was uh, protected under the Endangered Species Act in 1990, was listed as threatened under the ESA. Um, and critically, in 1994, um, critical habitat was designated. And it was one of the most expansive critical habitat designations in the history of the Endangered Species Act. Um enormous swaths of the Mojave Desert were designated critical habitat. Um, and this was seen as essential to protecting the species by protecting these reserves where 
um, where their uh, uh, density would be the highest. Um, and so uh, the critical habitat designation really has driven a lot of conservation over the past uh, uh, 25 years um, across the Mojave Desert. Um, I think the other element that has driven quite a bit of conservation is, um, at least up here in Nevada, uh, the Clark County Multiple Species Habitat Conservation Plan. Um, you know, the entire Las Vegas Valley is tortoise habitat. And so after listing, every time a subdivision developer wanted to plop down another subdivision, you know, they would need to get a take permit from Fish and Wildlife Service because they're destroying tortoise habitat. Clark County lumped all those permits together into a multi-species habitat conservation plan, which did take substantive uh, steps for tortoise conservation. For instance, uh, tortoises are not compatible with cows um, at all. <laughs> and uh, the Clark County MSHCP mitigation uh, bought out almost all of the grazing allotments uh, on the Nevada side of the Mojave Desert, uh, which was of substantial benefit to uh, uh, desert tortoises. Incidentally, one of those grazing permits that was bought out was Clive and Bundy's permit, and he kept on grazing after that. So uh, that's a different story for a different day, but um, kind of a interesting tangent to the Clark County MSHCP story. Um, so anyway, there was there were some of these foundational actions um, protecting tortoise habitat um, that were taken shortly after listing or in the years after listing. I think um, some of the actions that happened sort of in the 2000s were trying to get a hold of uh, OHVs. And that's where the Center for Biological Diversity got heavily involved, was trying to rein in the abuse of off-highway vehicles across the Mojave Desert. That meant suing the BLM many times over land use plan amendments. Um, and that meant intervening in directly in certain instances when there were uh, particular abuses of off-highway vehicle users. Um, but ultimately, you know, it was widely recognized that OHVs were uh, impacting the tortoise, uh, there was a popular movement against off-highway vehicles. Like sometimes when you're fighting for an endangered species, it's just you and the Endangered Species Act and the courts versus the world. Um, but on off-highway vehicles, there was really a widespread consensus among not just the environmental community, but just people who cared about the desert, that OHVs were out of control. And I think the especially the kind of 10 years start from 2000 to 2010 when a lot of heavy OHV litigation was going on, we, we saw some of those abuses reined in um, across the desert. So I think that's been a really important piece of um, uh, conservation, particularly in the California desert. Um, and then uh, certainly, you know, utility scale solar has been a major fight um, for the desert tortoise. And many groups have been engaged in fighting back against some ill-sighted utility scale solar projects. Um, to be perfectly honest, most of those fights have been uh, uh, either completely futile or resulted in uh, better mitigation, but um, it's been rare, if ever, that a project has just uh, folded um, due to desert tortoise concerns. Um, and so, uh, you know, there's kind of a mixed track record of the success of pushing back against some of those projects. Um, that does not stop people from continuing to do so, but... Um, you know, fighting back for the desert tortoise take, I mean, there's so many threats. Uh, you got to pick how you spend your time on a given day. So uh, most recently, I've been fighting back against uh, this uh, proposal to pass new federal lands legislation uh, for Southern Nevada, which would allocate more Bureau of Land Management land, public land, uh, for sale to developers uh, south of Las Vegas. They're trying to basically build a contiguous city from Las Vegas to the California border. Um, and so we've been fighting back against that legislation, trying to highlight not just the environmental impacts, the tortoise impacts of all that sprawl development, but also the justice and equity impacts, um, the uh, inequities of building sprawling suburbs for rich people on the outskirts of town while uh, people in the inner cities of town uh, suffer from a lower investment in their communities and the disproportionate impacts of climate change. So we've been trying to fight back against these sprawl developments, which would encroach on tortoise habitat. And um, that's been a significant fight for the future of the desert tortoise here in southern Nevada. So I have a couple small questions. One of them is that um, 
in the article I'm looking at, it talks about another threat to them is habitat conversion from invasive plant species. Um, and how how much is that a problem? Is yeah, that a pretty uh, small one? No, it's 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 a major problem. Um, I think, you know, like I said earlier, the litany of issues faced by the tortoise are so lengthy we could just do a laundry list. Um, so invasive species, I think some of the chief ones that affect the tortoise are invasive schismus and uh, red brome, which are annual grasses. And these annual grasses crowd out the species that the tortoise historically fed on um, and really do change the ecosystem. They also change the fire regime, having all of these annual grasses which dry up into fine fuels uh, in the summer. Uh, that's not historically how the desert vegetation structure was was configured. And so the Mojave Desert has been experiencing wildfire which historically it did not. Historically, the Mojave Desert did not burn in any significant fashion. And we've had 10, 100,000 acre fires fueled by these invasive grasses, which are devastating to the desert tortoise, just devastating. Um, and so, yeah, invasives is a significant issue. There's also Saharan mustard, um, which has taken over significant portions of the Mojave Desert and crowds out native vegetation. So uh, another problem I've heard about is I'm going to read you a couple sentences. Um, the Fort Irwin National Training Center, the U.S. Army, expanded into an area that was habitat for about 2,000 desert tortoises and contained critical desert tortoise habitat. In March 2008, about 650 tortoises were moved by helicopter and vehicle 35 kilometers away. And I've read about this with other projects, too, where they attempt to um, to to move desert tortoises and – Relocation of animals of any sort is often fraught, and is 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 relocating tor tortoises isn't that also problematical? Yes, I mean the the short, straightforward answer is translocation is a flawed solution that ultimately will not prevent the extinction of the desert tortoise. Um, uh, there is a relatively high success rate of preventing the direct mortality of translocated tortoises. Um, so after one year, most of those tortoises are still alive. Now, in some cases, which is just tragic, you know, you can put that tortoise somewhere hundreds of miles away and they'll immediately start walking back home, which is just kind of awful to think about. You know, they are so attuned to the geography and magnetic fields of the earth or whatever they can pinpoint where they're supposed to be and start walking 100 miles back to their house um so that that's sort of depressing um but but moreover uh, uh science has shown that um males translocated males are failing to reproduce so females translocated females apparently are reproducing because there's uh male tortoises wandering around who will you know Lift, lift the skirts of anything that looks female. Um, but uh, the male tortoises, the male translocated tortoises, uh, are apparently being outcompeted by the males whose territory they are being translocated into and are failing to reproduce, which means that translocation of tortoises results in a 50% loss of genetic diversity. And that is unacceptable. If you're trying to proclaim translocation as acceptable mitigation, the idea that you could lose 50 percent of your genetic diversity and call that a success is, is just a farce. And another question I wanted to ask is there's mention of illegal collection and there are adoption programs. Is, is capture for pets a significant problem or is that a smaller problem? So, uh, again, our litany of concerns for the desert tortoise, one of the early concerns for the tortoise was an upper respiratory infection, which uh, uh, was transmitted to wild tortoises, excuse me, from captive tortoises. So, yes, especially historically, collection was a significant issue. People would collect them and keep them as pets. And then at some point, you know, these are incredibly long-lived creatures, so they would release them back into the wild. Um, but these tortoises would have this upper respiratory disease and they would pass it to wild tortoises. So that was a major issue in the 90s and uh, 2000s. It still is an issue. But uh, to be honest, like the, the population of tortoises now is like the survivors of a pandemic. So 
it's not as much of an issue now because it already killed off many, many, many tortoises. So as a result, the whole issue of captive tortoises has become major in the past 20 years because there are organizations trying to figure out what the hell to do with all these pet tortoises that no one wants. And so there was a tortoise conservation center outside Las Vegas that held on to captive tortoises. Um, uh, they do adoption programs trying to adopt them out, but they categorically cannot be released into the wild because they will transmit potentially this upper respiratory disease. Um, uh, as for collecting now, collecting now is not a major issue for the desert tortoise, only because you can walk around for a very long time and not find a tortoise. Like, it's hard to find a tortoise. So no one's going out there to collect them to make money because you're not going to make any money. So does this mean – and uh, I, I don't know what your perspective is on captive breeding programs. Mine is – agnostic like california condors i'm really glad that they it's a last resort and if it works that's great but i would prefer that it didn't have to happen um is that even talked about with desert tortoises captive breeding or does this respiratory problem mean captive breeding makes work? more sense i'm sorry go ahead yeah, captive breeding makes more sense. Captive breeding makes more sense when you are down to really critical population levels, um, because then your augmentation can actually make a material difference in the number of species. You know, with the tortoise, there are still tens of thousands of tortoises out there, literally tens of thousands. So it's unlikely that captive breeding would make a dent in the tortoise population because it's unlikely you're going to captive breed 10,000 tortoises. Um, so, you know, that's not, that's just not really thought of right now. The, 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 the focus right now is trying to address some of the drivers of the tortoise's catastrophic decline, like off highway vehicles, like vehicle collisions. There's various efforts to rein in the ravens. Um, uh, certainly, you know, we're fighting against residential sprawl to try to stop some of that habitat loss. So we need to we need to address the drivers. I think by the time we're doing captive breeding of the desert tortoise, it'll be too late. So the problem, and sorry if it took me so long to get here, the problem is not actual numbers but density. That's right. That's right. The problem is density. If they spend the rest of their lives wandering around looking for a mate and they don't find one, you know, essentially their life was for naught because they were unable to perpetuate the species. Um, and, and so when you have entire geographic regions where the density is that low, that's essentially the extirpation of that species from that area. So what do you, um, we have about 10 minutes left and what do you, Lay out some potential futures for the desert tortoise, and you, you've already sort of laid out some um, where we will go if we continue the direction we are going. Can you lay out that a bit more and then also some more positive alternatives and what it would take to, to make those positive alternatives happen? I mean, there's no sugarcoating it. The fate of the desert tortoise is extremely grim, extremely grim. Uh, it's all but assured to go extinct in the state of California outside of Joshua Tree National Park within our lifetimes. Um, uh, it is likely as the climate changes that only the northern part of the tortoise's range will be viable because it will be too hot in the southern part of the range which really emphasizes the importance of conserving habitat in Nevada and Utah and connectivity so that natural migration northward can occur. Um, so that's some of the focus of the conservation efforts. Uh, I think if we are successful in stopping the tortoises' habitat loss due to direct destruction from sprawl and solar energy, if we are successful in maintaining connectivity, and most importantly, if we stop burning fossil fuels and stop runaway climate change, I think the tortoise could have a chance of persisting in the northern part of its range in, in Nevada and Utah. Um, 
may be a relics population in Joshua Tree if, if, if the climate change can be brought under control. But at our current trajectory, uh, the tortoise is staring down the barrel of extinction. So let's let's um, let's pretend for a second that uh, that 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 things go okay for at least some of the desert tortoises. And um, how do they? Uh, I'm wondering about migration, and I'm wondering about expansion of territory when things are going okay. That that wolves, um, you know, they can they can establish. You know, you get wolves in Idaho, and all of a sudden you have a wolf in Northern California because they go so far. But grizzly bears, I learned, basically expand only to adjacent territory once every generation. So grizzly bears expand habitat very slowly. And if you have a viable population of, of desert tortoises with some good habitat nearby, how do they move into it? <clears throat> do you see what I'm asking? Yeah, it, I mean, tortoises don't go very far in their whole lifetime. Uh, I actually don't know what the, the range of a tortoise is, but we're not talking, you know, these aren't migratory creatures. They're not ranging far and wide, um, uh, you know, like OR7, the wolf that went hundreds of miles. You know, the tortoise is nothing like that. You know, you're talking about multi-generational um, movements. Um, and... You know, I think the biggest question there is, can the tortoise keep up with climate change? And the answer may be no, you know, and there has been talk and it's just talk now of assisted migration where tortoises are moved northward into more hospitable climates. Now, that's a very controversial idea. Um, and I don't think we're there yet, but I think, you know, the climate is changing catastrophically in front of our very eyes. Um, I think ideas like assisted migration are going to be getting more purchase in the popular uh, conception of what to do about climate in the future. And we're all going to have to have some both scientific and ethical discussions about do we try to prevent the extinction of these species through extreme measures like that? One reason I was asking about that is because I interviewed somebody a few years ago about Joshua trees, and they said one of the problems with Joshua trees and climate change is that they expand their range extremely slowly. That's what made me think about well, tortoises. And one of their primary drivers of expanding their range were the giant sloths who were there, who <laughs> ate their seeds, uh, you know, and they co-evolved with. Uh, but, of course, there's no more giant sloths anymore, so the Joshua tree's at a disadvantage um, with moving its range. And, uh, you know, I mean, desert creatures tend to be, and I, mean, I use creature to include plants, desert organisms tend to be long-lived, uh, tend to have very slow growth rates, tend to have relatively small ranges as far as an individual organism's range. Um, and, uh, you know, we're not talking about wolves here. We're not talking about species that can just hop, hop northward when it gets too hot. Um, you know, these are going to be multi-generational uh, uh, phenomena. Uh, of these these movement of ranges. So it seems to me that desert tortoises are just inherently charismatic. And um, how how can we um, promote a greater love and awareness of desert tortoises and of their plight? And and then once we do that, how do we if people are interested, how can they help either your work or or help desert tortoises in general? Tortoises are very charismatic, and there's the famous story of uh, uh, when when the Sierra Club was working to get the California Desert Protection Act passed, which designated three and a half million acres of wilderness and millions of acres of national parks and was one of the greatest conservation achievements in history, really. Um, uh, they famously brought tortoises to Washington, D.C., uh, and uh, one was in uh, Diane Feinstein's office, um, and uh, uh, this was, and I guess Bill Clinton had some interaction with this tortoise. Um, so they, they are a charismatic species and help drive conservation. Um, you know, what can we do to save the desert tortoise? Um, I think for starters, like many decisions involving the desert tortoise happen through politicians, whether that's the Secretary of Interior making decisions on BLM land and Park Service land, whether that's 
local politicians making land use policy decisions about sprawl. Um, so voting for people who are going to prioritize species conservation over uh, 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 economic desires um, is critical. Voting for the right people. And honestly, like, I mean, you hate to be this simplistic about it, but climate change is going to destroy this species unless we do something drastic. Like we need to support politicians who support the Green New Deal, who support a radical decarbonization of our economy as fast as humanly possible. Uh, if this tortoise has a chance. So, you know, you hate to just punt to, well, get out there and vote. But, um, you know, that is a critical component because right now decisions are being made above the regulatory level. They're being made at the political level. Um, so I think that's critical. Uh, you know, supporting my organizations like the Center for Biological Diversity. Um, you know, I always tell people when they ask what they can do that clicktivism works. So clicking those action alerts and sending an email to policymakers actually does have an effect, even if people think they don't. Uh, activists like me will then have a rhetorical point to use in making our uh, case that, look, thousands and thousands of people support uh, desert tortoise conservation. Um, that is a powerful tool in, in the activist toolbox. So I would say if folks want to help save the desert tortoise, respond to those action alerts you get in your email box and, and click yes uh, <laughs> to support uh, those issues. So uh, th those are a couple of things. Well, thank you so much for your tremendous work in the world, and thank you for caring about desert tortoises. And I would like to thank listeners for listening. My guest today has been Patrick Donnelly. This is Derek Gentum for Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network.